major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening. It's Thursday, June 16th. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Nearly 800 unhoused people died last year in San Diego County, and that's according to the medical examiner. As KPBS reporter John Carroll shows us, a vigil is being held tonight to bring attention to this crisis. In the midst of one of the most expensive neighborhoods in San Diego. Everybody wants a fair shot at the pursuit of happiness. A call to action to help those who have no permanent place to live in San Diego, especially people of color. 5% of our population in San Diego are black, and yet 24% of our homeless population are black. That is not an accident. On the lawn of Waterfront Park, the San Diego Emergency Housing Alliance kicked off a tent vigil, the third such event to be held this year. The data showing how much of the homeless population here is black comes from the most recent point-in-time count. Yusef Miller with the North County Equity and Justice Coalition, as well as the California Poor People's Campaign, says the root of the problem is not what most of us might think. Is this a problem of funding? I say no. Is this a problem of facilities? I also say no. Is this a problem of processes? I say no. The heart of the problem is our soul. The heart of the problem is our compassion for our brothers and sisters, our siblings on the streets. The organizers of this tent vigil say it's meant to be in solidarity with the National Coalition for the Homeless, National Day of Action Against Sweeps, as in sweeping away homeless encampments, to be held this weekend in Washington, D.C. The Poor People's Campaign also is set to hold its moral march on Washington and to the polls this Saturday. This line of tents presents a few different messages. For those who don't have permanent housing, this is the way a lot of them live. And there are messages spelled out on them. On one side, end criminalization. On the other, housing, not handcuffs. And as the sun sets tonight, lights will be placed in each of them, a sign of hope, perhaps, that soon we may finally be able to solve this problem. Along the Embarcadero, John Carroll, KPBS News. Recovery efforts are still underway in Mission Beach. Lifeguards are still looking for an 18-year-old high school graduate who was pulled under the water by rip current on Tuesday while celebrating with friends. Those two friends were rescued, but friends and family of Wood Lane Sachet are still waiting for word as they put together a memorial at the beach for the teen. Lifeguards are using dive teams and sonar technology in their efforts to find him. We have two side scan sonars now. We have one that's called the tow fish that is submersible and um, it goes under the surface and scans the bottom and we get our best uh, visual from that one. Chief Gartland added that there is no timeline as to how long the recovery efforts will last. The prospect of more summertime beach closures in the South County has beach communities and county officials at odds. KPBS environment reporter Eric Anderson explains. Imperial Beach officials are facing a summer of closed beaches and that hits the South County community in the pocketbook. Polluted water postings are up sharply in Imperial Beach and Coronado since May. San Diego County Department of Environmental Health officials say better testing is revealing more pollution. But Imperial Beach Mayor Serge Dedina wants to talk to county officials about whether the new test results actually mean the water is unsafe for beachgoers. The county rolled out a new testing methodology. We're closing beaches when the city of San Diego tests for the old, the old testing show that the beaches are clean. Dedina wants additional factors like ocean currents figured in before pollution warning signs go up. He says he's reached out to the county but hasn't gotten a response. We should have been meeting with the county weeks ago, a meeting we requested. And we still have not met with the county of San Diego to have that discussion. And frankly, I've never been more disrespected as a city 
Um, and as someone who does environmental work and has worked with the county for 35 years, I've never seen them attempt to avoid having stakeholders in the room to talk about this. County environment officials say that's not the case. They say for the past nine years, they've been preparing stakeholders for the new faster water quality tests. They expected more positive pollution tests, but are surprised that there have been so many beach closures in the South County. These are the only beaches where we're experiencing these increased closures. The county's Heather Bonomo says the new tests find DNA fragments in samples instead of the old method of culturing samples and seeing what grows in the lab. She says safety standards were created by state and federal officials and they will not be changed. Bonomo says the attention should be on the water, not the tests. There's sewage contamination in the water and we really need to focus on the root cause of this issue, which is the sewage contamination. That's where we need to focus our efforts. Nonetheless, closing beaches is a crushing blow to communities that rely on tourist traffic during the summer. Dadina likens it to closing Main Street in his town. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. COVID vaccines for the youngest kids could be going into arms as early as next week. KPBS health reporter Matt Hoffman has more on the recent authorization by the FDA. Federal regulators say the benefits of COVID vaccines in kids as young as five outweigh any risks. As with adults, the doses are found to give protection against serious illness and death. The dose is lower, but it's exactly the same in every other way. So Rady Children's Hospital infectious disease specialist Dr. Mark Sawyer sat on the FDA committee that authorized vaccines for kids under five. Pending CDC approval, children could be receiving the doses as early as next week, something that some parents have been waiting a long time for. There is a subset of parents who continue to be very concerned about COVID and COVID exposures. So much so that they've isolated their children from all of their regular activities. And this vaccine is going to provide reassurance. Side effects in younger kids are similar to adults, including sore arms and fatigue. Rady Children's Hospital is getting ready to start administering doses as early as next week. But there has been hesitation among many parents to get younger kids vaccinated. In San Diego County, just 44% of kids ages 5 to 11 have gotten their shots. The important points that I want those parents to think about as they make that decision is that Although COVID is generally not severe in young children, it can be severe. We've had, you know, dozens and dozens of children hospitalized here at Rady Children's Hospital. Sawyer says his three grandchildren will get the vaccine as soon as it becomes available. Right now, he doesn't see schools mandating vaccines broadly because they aren't designed to completely prevent infections. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. Today's January 6th Congressional Committee hearing focused on the pressure former President Trump put on the Vice President Mike Pence to overturn the 2020 election results. Pence did not appear on Capitol Hill, but as Karen Kaifa reports, two of his close legal advisors did. A former federal judge who advised Mike Pence ahead of January 6, 2021, outlining a stark scenario the country could have faced if the former vice president succumbed to pressure from former President Donald Trump. Tantamount to a revolution. In live and videotape testimony before the House Committee investigating the Capitol insurrection, Pence's inner circle detailed the campaign by Trump and his allies, who wrongly insisted Pence was within his bounds to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election during the congressional certification on January 6th. Our review of text, history, um, and frankly just common sense all confirmed the vice president's first instinct on that point. There is no uh, justifiable basis to conclude that the vice president has that kind of authority. Witnesses said Trump was told repeatedly that the plan for Pence to overturn the election was unconstitutional. Former Pence Chief of Staff Mark Short said he was concerned enough about Trump turning on Pence that he alerted the Secret Service on January 5th. I wanted to make sure the head of the vice president's Secret Service was aware that um, that likely as these disagreements became more public that the president would um, lash out in some way. Shortly before Pence appeared at the Capitol for the ceremonial role, he released a letter saying he would not honor Trump's wishes. Hey, 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 
Pence and his family were forced into hiding when the pro-Trump mob entered the building. In Washington, I'm Karen Kafa. It's the largest scandal in Navy history. More than two dozen naval officers pleaded guilty to taking bribes to help the man dubbed Fat Leonard defraud the Navy. As the court cases wrap up after nearly a decade, watchdogs say the Navy's culture hasn't changed. KPBS military reporter Steve Walsh has the story. It was a corruption scandal of epic proportions. Malaysian defense contractor Leonard Francis used U.S. Navy officers to steer ships to his ports in the Western Pacific, greasing the wheels with gifts, sex workers, and lavish parties with scantily clad women. Vice Admiral Craig Fuller attended at least one party as a ship's captain. Senator Elizabeth Warren pressed him about it during a confirmation hearing in 2018. What do you say to women officers when they see that this is the kind of event you have attended? Senator, I have always had the utmost respect for all servicemen and women. The Navy cleared Fowler and other officers of wrongdoing. Francis pleaded guilty in 2015 to defrauding the Navy of at least $35 million. Dan Grazer is with the Project on Government Oversight. He says hundreds of officers watch Francis, widely known as Fat Leonard for his size, lay out the red carpet. It just became kind of the way business was done within the Seventh Fleet. And, you know, the longer it went on, the more people got involved in it and the more normalized that behavior became. And so it, we ended up with a massive scandal that we we have. Among the Navy officials on Francis's payrolls was an agent for the Navy's criminal service who pleaded guilty to taking bribes to keep Francis up to date on the Navy's own investigations. Still, Senator Warren's exchange is one of only a handful of times the so-called Fat Leonard cases come up on Capitol Hill during the decade-long probe. Again, Dan Grazer. And it's shocking how, how little people even today in Washington uh, really even know about Fat Leonard. No, it rarely makes the news here. Once the scandal broke, the Navy took away some of the authority officers have to decide which ports to use. Though the Navy tightened up the paperwork, it hasn't taken a hard look at the underlying culture which allowed officers to condone the party atmosphere. Pauline Chanks Corinne teaches ethics at the Naval War College. It's not something, at least in my circles, that the Navy is talking a lot about, and so I'm not sure that we've learned the lessons or have thought about what this means for Navy culture. Francis was arrested in San Diego in 2013, but Pauline Shanks Corinne says the War College still hasn't incorporated a case study about the massive bribery scandal into its ethics curriculum. One senior leader said to me, listen, like, I know people who were involved. Um, and I've heard from other uh, senior leaders things like, well, I had a, you know, a friend, a good friend whose career was ruined because of this. And, you know, so I think there's just a real people don't want to talk about it. When students talk about it in class, they talk about different spanks for different ranks. The notion that higher ranking officers were treated differently. Ron Carr, a retired Navy captain, says the case cast a long shadow over everyone who served in the Pacific during the 2000s and early 2010s. It really has put mud uh, for all of us who, who were not involved with this because there's always that assumption that potentially maybe we just didn't get caught. Carr was a logistics officer on board the USS Blue Ridge. As the flagship for the U.S. Pacific Fleet, the Blue Ridge was at the center of the federal indictments. Given the size of the problem, Carr is disappointed that the Fat Leonard case didn't shine a brighter light on Navy corruption. I think the challenge uh, from a publicity point of view is that it just dragged out for so long. Here we are having this conversation when he was arrested uh, nine years ago. Nearly a decade later, as the Fat Leonard case draws to a close, it's still unclear how much the scandal has changed the Navy culture. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. Gas prices keep hitting new record highs and small businesses are having a hard time keeping up. KPBS North County reporter Tanya Thorne takes a closer look. Juan Verduzco owns 24-7 Movers Vista. No matter what the price at the pump reads, he relies on his trucks to get his work done. This truck, um, I will say around $240, $250. Before gas was averaging $6 per gallon, Verduzco says he could fill up his moving trucks with about half of what he's paying now. 
that's really the hard part you know running our business you know when you have to uh, go you know to San Diego National City San T for a minimal call service that it is three hours so you only get paid for three hours and so it's a two hours drive back and forth uh, that all the price all the money that you supposed to make uh, it kind of stay, you know, with the gas price and also the employees, you know, so it's, it's not much money that it comes, you know, to the owners. Verduzco says he hasn't raised his prices because he knows his clients are also dealing with this economy and higher rates could scare business away. But where Verduzco has seen an increase in business are out-of-state moves. More people that are moving out of California than people moving in. They say they're leaving because um, the, the, the high price of living in San Diego is really, uh, you know, it's really, uh, is not affordable, you know, so people cannot afford anymore to live in here. Leonardo Hernandez owns Los Reyes Landscape and Maintenance. Nosotros queremos aumentar el precio y los clientes como que andan pensándola muy bien si es... Si, si, o no, y es... He says he wants to raise his rates in order to keep up with the price of gas. But he notices clients then think twice about hiring him or look for cheaper service. Si vamos un poquito más lejos, digamos, uh, más como el, el centro del condado, este, tenemos que cobrar un poco más. Hernández says new clients call him, but if the distance is too far, he has to charge more or sometimes he turns the job down because there's no profit after having to fill up. Aside from his work trucks, his machinery also runs on gas. Es de gasolina y esta es una sopladora. He says that as much as he'd like to switch his gas run equipment to electric, they're too expensive. Queremos saber qué qué puede hacer el gobernador. He wants to know what the governor is doing about lowering gas prices because the situation isn't getting any better. Blanca Perez is a house cleaner. She says she feels lucky that she has enough work for the week. Pues antes mi carrito lo llenaba con 40 dólares y ahora pues lo lleno con 80 y pues con el mismo por el mismo sueldo y pues es 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 frustrante. But her cost for gas has doubled and her income has stayed the same. She says some clients have been okay with small rate increases, but others have canceled their cleaning services. Like Verduzco and Hernandez, she says she also lost business to clients moving out of state. Muchos se están moviendo de aquí de California y también estoy perdiendo trabajo porque se están moviendo para otros estados por lo mismo de los precios tan elevados. Perez says she is considering getting a second job in order to keep up with her expenses. She hopes the governor is working on lowering gas prices and the cost of living because she thinks this is a problem that is hurting the lower and middle class the most. Tanya Thorne, KPBS News. With the official start of summer days away, scientists say a mega drought across the western U.S. could get even worse. Some farmers already have had their water sources cut off as the drought fuels devastating wildfires. Mike Valerio explains. As scarce water showers shades of gold across browning fields, the predictions are dire. It's scary to think that we may not be able to do this because we don't have the water to do it. Richard Bianchi is a fourth generation farmer here in Hollister, California. His fields, farm and family are now facing the U.S. mega drought, which scientists say is the worst western dry spell in 1,200 years. More than 90 percent of the West is in a drought and Bianchi's most reliable water source is now shut off. So to be clear, Richard, you're getting no water, zero percent from yeah. your best water source. Correct. What are the biggest impacts? How would you explain that to somebody outside of Hollister? It's limiting the amount of ground that we can farm. It's, the amount, it's limiting the amount of the intensity that we can farm. Bianchi has no choice but to pump lower quality groundwater into his fields, and he's not sure how long that'll last. Less water limits the crops he can grow, and he tells us that reduces our choices at the grocery store. Economists say less supply pushes prices even higher, more pain on top of sky-high inflation. The drought leaves fields fallow, and scientists say fuels historic infernos. Climate science connects deepening droughts with dried up earth all around us to longer, more severe wildfire seasons. In fact, the fires in New Mexico started much earlier this year than in years past, and right now, it's only spring.
Federal officials tell us the nightmare is already here. Up to three quarters of Northern California's farming fields could stay fallow, growing nothing this summer. For Bianchi, whether there's a future for a fifth generation of his family's farmers is now in doubt. Are we going to have water in two, three years out of, the, out of our aquifer? Nobody could say that. In Hollister, California, I'm Mike Valerio reporting. We've had some warmer days the past couple of days, but now cooling will start to spread. We've already experienced that right along the coast, but that will work its way further inland for your Friday and your Saturday. And then we're looking at this approaching low pressure system, this trough that will also bring some strong and gusty southwest to west winds across the mountains and the deserts. And then if you're looking for some warmth once again, those warmer temperatures arriving back for your Sunday and Monday. But we will also deal with the thickening marine layer, so that means low clouds once again for tonight, holding temperatures pretty steadily into the lower 60s, more interior where you won't see some of those clouds. Ramona falling back to the 50s, Escondido 58, Mount Laguna 64, Campo 52, Borrego Springs falling back to around 74. Let's talk Friday. We're going to see some moisture start to develop here, which is some good news for the wildfire situations when it comes to the beneficial rain, but bad news when it comes to burn scars uh, because that could easily cause some more damage as well. So that's something Thing to watch here from Grand Junction down to Albuquerque. Windy and hot across the Great Basin, but again, I mentioned that cooling with that trough working its way on shore. So high temperatures will be 5 to 15 degrees lower than what they were for today. All right, here's that thick cloud coverage, that marine layer that we're going to be dealing with for a good deal of the day for San Diego to La Vista Oceanside as well. And eventually some of those clouds will work their way further inland, so you'll start to see some increasing cloud coverage. Ramona getting to 81. El Cajon 78. Here comes the trough. It's much cooler for the weekend. More of you starting to experience that. Whereas across the desert southwest, it does remain seasonably hot. And we see that warming trend kick back into gear along the coast starting on Sunday. Same for the inland areas. You'll see it ramping up by Sunday as well, where you're back to the upper 80s by Tuesday. Further inland you go, and even for the mountains, you'll see 70s again by the time we get to Monday. And for the desert, you get a little bit of a break from the triple digits, if anything, on Saturday, and it's back to triple digit heat by the time we wrap up the weekend on Sunday. For KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Michelle Rotella. Chula Vista removed the Christopher Columbus statue from Discovery Park and now it's looking to get rid of it for good. A task force is seeking statements of interest to transfer ownership of the statue to any museum, historical society or educational organization. Submissions must detail where it would be displayed and what historical information would be included. The task force will review all submissions and may invite applicants to interview at a public meeting. The city council will have the final say on where the statue will will end up. The San Diego Gallery is featuring and selling art made by Ukrainians in an effort to help families who are still there in the midst of a war. KPBS reporter Kitty Alvarado visited the exhibit. We have a warning. The images you will see in this story include graphic and violent depictions of war. Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the horrors of war are on full display inside the Bread and Salt Art Gallery in Barrio Logan. Every piece of art was made by artists in Ukraine during the darkest time in their lives. The pain evident in every inch of canvas, paper and screen. Pain that Eugenia Brodsky, the curator, says must be seen and heard. Silence is also violence, so all of us, all of the Ukrainians start to be very loud and this, like, all of these works, they are like a scream. She says that scream is many things, including a cry for help. Because the world, like, can't be silent anymore. You can't just have comfortable life and do not uh, see what is going on in the world because some something in this system broke. The art, like the scream, is also purposeful and cathartic, a release for Ukraine's most creative to show the world what they've seen, what their people have endured and are still living through. Jenny Prisk says seeing this art is emotional. 
It's so real that I immediately felt the pain of the painters and of the people of Ukraine. It comes right out at you in the paintings. They are stark and they are um, they're very they depict the the abject pain that they're feeling, whether they be in shelters, whether they're running from bombs, whether they are uh, living afraid of of the Russian invasion. And these are very very real. The exhibit is also a sale with all profits going directly directly to 25 pre-screened families who are still in Ukraine and in desperate need of help. Very often the funds are not funneled where they should be and the fact that 100% is going to a Ukrainian family, I, I'm delighted. Brodsky and her family came to San Diego after being stuck abroad while on vacation. She may be more than 6,000 miles away, but she says she feels the heartache of her people and had to do something to raise awareness and funds. She hopes others are moved to help too. What is your mission in this life? Can you uh, to help someone or can you to feel this love? The exhibit ends Friday. Kitty Alvarado, KPBS News. The San Diego Zoo is welcoming a new addition. So take a look. This aardvark cub is the first to be born at the zoo in more than 35 years. The female cub who doesn't have a name yet and her mother Zola won't be on exhibit for about two months while they bond. Native to sub-Saharan Africa, the aardvark is mostly nocturnal, spending the day in their burrows. An adult aardvark may eat up to 50,000 insects in a single evening. How about that? <laughs> so cute. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Good night. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation. Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. And by viewers like you, thank you.